Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, I wanted to shoot a quick video today continuing with my uh, ski related topics about uh, the way I choose my bindings for my skis. And so I have uh, one, two, three, four, five <laughs> examples right here of different bindings that I use for different things. So I got a number of different reasons for choosing my bindings, but there are kind of the primary ones of front country and back country. And so to start with the easy one, which would be front country skis, here's an example of a front country binding. This is just a standard Alpine. This is the marker Griffin 13. And um, I usually set the DIN somewhere around uh, nine or 10 when I'm in the back, or for these Alpine bindings. Um, and pretty much all of my Alpine specific skis have a marker Griffin 13 on them. I don't exactly have a specific reason for using the Griffin 13. I just know that it's a really good Alpine binding. It's a very popular one. It's almost always in stock when I go to find it. Uh, 13 DIN is more than enough for what I need. And uh, I just think it's a really solidly built binding. It's got good anti-friction. It has good release. Um, the heel and the brake system works really great. So I just kind of found a binding in the Alpine world that I like, and I kind of work with it for all of my Alpine specific skis. Now the exception to that would be this, uh, my M6 Mantra right here. Uh, and this one, I have a different marker binding. This is the F12 Tor. That's right, it's kind of rubbed off right here. It's hard to see. Now, the reason why I got this binding was I kind of needed an Alpine binding for a ski and I wanted, I guess, the option to, <laughs> I've never used a frame binding before, so I kind of wanted that. There's, for those of you who don't know how it works, there's this lever right here, which I can pop and that actually shifts the entire plate down right here. And uh, if you clip your boot into it, you can rotate the whole binding pivots on the toe right there and you can walk uphill. And then when you're ready to ski with it, after you skin uphill, you just take your boot out, flip this pin back up, and that locks the binding to the ski, and then you're ready to go downhill. And so, yeah, this is the only frame binding that I own. Uh, I used it for ski patrol, so it has quite a bit of days on it. You can see kind of, it's getting a little rough here and there. This may be the last ski for this binding if it um, all of a sudden my boot starts popping out. Uh, but the reason why I have it on this ski is because I didn't want to buy a new binding for this ski. So I just transferred it from my old ski onto it. And uh, I actually think that these have a purpose in two circumstances. There's the professional and then there's the recreationalist. I still think these bindings are kind of fun to use. Uh, in a recreational sense, because if you just have one ski, or if you have your really heavy ski that you want to bring into the backcountry, short little skins, then you can just, um, you know, clip your trekker into this binding and then toggle your way uphill and then send it on the way down. I also think it's kind of useful in the professional sense in two circumstances that come to my mind right now. One is if you are in, uh, a heli ski operation or a cat ski operation, you know, some of those mechanized ski ops where you have some form going uphill. That could be a snowmobile too. But uh, the primary, the majority of your time going uphill is gonna be done for you by whatever. And then you have to ski downhill with your clients. A lot of ski guides prefer having some sort of setup that they can go back uphill. So I can just cut a pair of skins for this ski and then I have a way of going back uphill for whatever reason, if your client has an issue or something like that. And so um, I have this hookup right here of the frame binding. Nice thing about these ones too is a frame binding compared to other downhill specific bindings that can go uphill is quite a bit cheaper. I don't exactly remember how much this binding was, but it was probably like the 250 range or something like that compared to something like uh, a Duke or, you know, uh, maybe something like a cast system. Those are definitely more expensive. Another time I can, I can imagine a use for some form of frame binding 
would be in ski patrol when you're doing avalanche mitigation. Because if you think about it, um, like I, I ski patrol at Crystal for a little bit, and uh, we would do avalanche mitigation on something like the throne out there. Well, if you've ever skied at Crystal, you know that the throne requires a bit of walking to get up there. And if you've had like a foot and a half of snow dumped, that's a lot of trail breaking and that's really hard. So a number of patrollers would use like skins and maybe their touring setup to get up there. And then they would switch into alpine bindings on the way or after they get back down. A number of ski patrols will require alpine bindings for the releaseability and maybe a few other reasons, but mainly the releaseability. And so this is a full on alpine binding in a touring package. So if I was doing something like avalanche mitigation and throwing bombs on a really heavy day, I think that this setup would be nice in order to skin my way, you know, throughout the avalanche route. There may be some routes where that's not as important or required, like routes where you're, you know, just skiing down along a ridge, and that's totally fine. Uh, also, your operation may not let you do it for whatever reason, so check with them before you go off of whatever my decisions are, but there's definitely a time where if I go back to professional ski patrol, I probably would use this binding on a heavy avalanche day, probably with a fatter ski, and uh, skin my way up to the part where we start lacing our bombs and whatnot. Um, so yeah, this is my only ski with a frame binding on it, and I think it's kind of neat to have one. It does affect the skiing a little bit because you are a bit higher off the ski uh, platform versus something like a... Uh, you know, a non-adjustment binding. If you buy a pair of demo skis and they have the demo plates that let you slide this thing around on them, then that can also kind of affect the performance of the ski. That's kind of like the inbound setup. I don't really do too much different from that. I do have a pair of look pivots right here that I bought off of a buddy and I still haven't found a ski to put them on. So maybe I'll get a ski and slap those pivots on and then I have a look pivot binding. Um, which I also think is a really nice binding, really safe, and it feels pretty good. So I know a lot of people like it. So I'll probably find something for that look pivot at some point. Um, moving into my kind of like backcountry skis, I have, uh, you know, standard day, other wider standard day, and then powder day. <coughs> and each of these bindings have slight variations, uh, starting with just the standard day ski. This is my 100 underfoot you know, smaller ski, smaller in comparison to the other ones. And uh, what I got on this is your standard tech binding. This is the Dina Fit uh, 140 Super Light, something like that. Maybe I'll put it in the, uh, the, the description there. This one has a DIN feature. I tend to set, if I have the option for DINs, I'll set my backcountry DINs at like 8. Or something like that. Um, that's usually where I put them. I don't really go much higher than that. Um, this ski, other features, you know, standard tech toe. There's nothing special with that. I can put crampons in right here. And uh, the heel, you have the rotating heel piece. Whoops. You got that whole rotating heel piece. Uh, this back end is actually your low riser. And this flipped over the the little spring right there is the high riser and then you have this one happens to have a set of brakes now the brakes on this are removable uh, i don't know if i'm sold on having brakes on this ski or not yet i'm going i'm sort of deciding this year the reason why i would want brakes on a backcountry ski aside from you know the the nice aspect of it having brakes uh in guiding Ski brakes can be useful because, depending on your terrain, we actually will put our skis into the snow as an anchor. And there's a number of different anchors you can use to, or use your skis to make. I can make a different video about it. But the deal is you either have brakes and a ski strap somewhere up here, and that keeps the skis from possibly scissoring each other, or you put two ski straps. So one thing that's nice about the brakes, other than the fact that you have brakes, is that you can slot the skis together and make your ski anchors a little bit easier in the backcountry. And that's the main reason why I have brakes on this ski. 
This is actually my only backcountry ski that has brakes. I have to see what it's like here in the Sierra for my standard days of ski guiding, which I haven't done any ski guiding yet. Uh, the season hasn't started yet, and this is my first season in the Sierra. Uh, so I gotta see how often I end up using those brakes or how much I like them before I make the final decision if I'm gonna take them off or not. But back in Washington, I could definitely see a use for ski brakes on skis. Now this other ski, uh, this is a bit, this is my like kind of midday ski, hopefully, <laughs> 108. And so this one has a DinaFit Speed Radical on it or something like that. Uh, all the DinaFit bindings have some form of DIN on them or I guess release value. Uh, I, again, I just have mine at eight. Uh, I don't really care about having a release value on my tech bindings. Um, but I mean, if they, if it comes with it, then it comes with it. And this is probably my favorite binding. My current favorite tech binding out there is the Dina fit. Uh, again, same standard deal, tech toe brakes right here, floating heel piece. This one, if you rotate it like so actually goes all the way flat and then you have just like the last one, mid riser and high riser. So I flip that back to normal. Um, yeah, and then because there's no brake right at the moment, I have a leash on it. A lot of times I may not put leashes on my skis even if I don't have brakes on them. That just depends on the terrain. At the moment, I'm gonna keep the leash on it. Uh, but I've managed pretty good on my skis not having a leash or a brake. You just have to be careful, a lot of guides do it. Uh, I didn't exactly go for which one is lighter versus that ski versus this ski because I went more for kind of features and durability. These are supposed to be guiding bindings, so I would like to get at least two or three seasons out of them and um, possibly two or th even three pairs of skis out of these bindings. I try to take really good care of my ski bindings because of that. And so, um, yeah, I was going for more durability and I've actually used this binding a fair amount. I have an older version on my Volcano skis that I like a lot. Um, I kind of like the feeling, I like the action. Some people may not like how high the heel is off the post, but uh, I find that that isn't really a problem at least. Um, and then it, that forward lean can kind of help you stay in the front. But other than that, yeah, I really just kind of, on wider skis like this 108, I kind of don't really tend to use brakes that much. I find they kind of just add weight. And you know, there are times where you can lose your ski whether it has a brake or not. So if they only work about half the time, some people make the argument why I even have them at all. <laughs> yeah, for wider skis, I about, yeah, a little bit wider than 100, I will probably forego the brake. Maybe a 105 ski or something like that, I'll add in a brake. And uh, it obviously goes without saying all my inbound skis have brakes because they just come with the bindings. Moving on to my final example here. This is my powder ski, it's a 120. And I have a super minimalist lightweight binding here. This is the ATK World Cup. It, um, yeah, it's super lightweight. So why did I go with the lightweight binding? A number of reasons, but uh, one is this is my fattest and longest ski. So to help save on weight, I can go with a more minimalist binding. Another thing is since this is my powder ski, it's probably gonna be used in powder conditions. Like I'm not gonna bring this out in the middle of spring corn skiing. I'm just going to bring it out when we got a big dump of snow. So it's not gonna be used as much as say the daily driver skis. Another th reason is when I'm skiing in those like heavy dump conditions, Generally, we're not going to be slaying hard too much, you know. We're going to be more nervous about abbey conditions, wind slab, storm slab, cornices could build up, you know, anything. So when you get those larger dumps of powder, you tend to step it back a little bit and stay in, you know, higher 20s, low 30s type terrain. So I don't really need a hard charging binding. I just need something that kind of holds my foot to the ski. You can see the heel piece right here. It's just the single U spring. I believe it has a release value of nine, so that's perfect for me. And then um, you can see it's also fixed. Like there's no turning this thing. So in order to actually um, go into skin mode, you're obligated to put that 
heel lifter down. And even on the flats, you have to roll with the foot on that heel lifter. Now this heel lifter or riser or whatever is smaller. It's lower to the ski than the first riser on all of those other bindings for one. And two, um, when, you know, if you're on any form of incline, this is flat. If you're on any form of incline, your foot's kind of solid. So uh, a lot of people, when they skin, they just automatically flip the riser over if they have a really low one and go uphill. Now, obviously, these things are made for schemo. So, you know, the less you do in schemo, that's a super quick transition right there. And then heel in and then unlock your toe and you're good to go. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a cool thing. I guess you could say it's a bit of an experiment using a binding this strip down, which I haven't before. But if you're skiing 30 degree powder, it's really easy skiing. It's not super demanding. So you can afford to have a little bit less that still does a good job at keeping your foot attached to the ski. And so, yeah, just in the idea of keeping the weight down, because this is kind of a fat and big ski this is my, you know, this is 185. It's not like a super small ski. So just in order to keep weight down, I've gone with a super stripped down binding. I think more people are moving to that nowadays than um, having something like a uh, heavy binding on a big fat ski. So yeah, that's my reasoning between, or how I choose bindings for my skis. You can see there's a little bit of variation in there, but really not that much. Ultimately, it all kind of holds the same reasoning of, you know, having more lightweight set up or having a bit more features when it comes to the backcountry. And inbounds, it's kind of more about having that good release value, putting in a good, nice, uh, solid ski boot for maximum performance, and uh, having maybe something in the middle, like, again, a frame binding for very specific circumstances if you happen to work in very specific things, at least in my world. Uh, there are some other bindings I'd like to try out, like the cast system. I would really like to have a ski with that set up. Uh, I've owned marker kingpins in the past. I thought that there, there were good bindings, but uh, you know, just like a little bit extra than what I really care to deal with. And, um, you know, there's other stuff like the Duke PT and, and the shifts. How could I forget the shifts? So, you know, I'm not saying that I wouldn't go for one of those bindings in the future for specific things, uh, but I kind of want to pair it up with the right ski. So if you own a cast system or a shift or whatever, I would not put that on a lightweight ski like this. This is only like 1400 grams or something because I'm only using this for skiing in the backcountry and ski guiding and stuff like that. I would put it on something like uh, this ski, I guess. This is about 1700 grams. You can see I sized it longer for the resort so that way I could have a bit more ski to work with. And it's not a light setup. So if you put something like a shift binding on this, then I could bring this out into the backcountry and then ski hard out there, but I'm also going to have to upgrade my boots. So instead of bringing my more lightweight touring boots for the touring skis, I'm gonna to have to bring a heavier boot. And now you have a heavier boot with a heavier ski with a heavier binding, and that setup's heavier in general, which is great for going downhill, but if you're always going uphill, like me, in a guiding sense, and if you're not skiing super crazy stuff, I'm gonna go with the lighter weight stuff and save my legs for when I can really shred. In the future, you may see me with this vocal blaze right here with something like a cast system on it or something like that. Something like, uh, you know, you can really lean into it. Or like another Wander Alpine, like their 108 or something with a cast system. Cause um, then you can really like perform with that ski. I don't really get the point of putting a heavy binding with a heavy boot on a lightweight ski because that's just not balanced. You need to balance out your setup. So the big thing that's holding me back from bindings like those is just finding the right ski form within the skiing that I like to do and within my quiver. I also have quite a bit of skis right now, so it's kind of hard to, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to um, start buying more, <laughs> you know, with all this. I got to ruin a few pairs first. So thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate all the support you've given me. If you want me to make a video about something else, or uh, if you want me to review a video made by someone else, then 
send it my way or write a comment or whatever. Thanks for watching. Ski season starts tomorrow for me. One of the resorts that I actually own a pass for is opening up. So I'm super psyched and I'm ready to actually get out on the snow again and start sliding around. Maybe I'll make some videos on that in the future too. Nothing wrong with that. So uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.